Okay, we're now recording. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, Sam. And, and everybody, thanks for being here uh, today. Uh, we've got, um, as, as Sam mentioned, Marcy, Anne, and I, and we're looking forward to talking to you about our EBS plans. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of ebooks, but you might not know how many ebooks. We have many, many ebooks. And because of the plans that we offer right now, we can, um, I'm going to stop my video here. Um, we have access to over 200,000 ebooks just because of these plans, which is pretty exciting. So you might have heard a bunch of acronyms, EBA, DDA, EBM, EBS, UBCM. And so we're going to talk about that today. It's very confusing, or it can be. So our, our main focus today is these evidence based acquisitions plans. Some companies call them evidence-based selection. One, Wiley, calls it usage-based collection management because they want to be different. And it's all the same concept. What we do is we um, have a set amount that the, the publisher says, or the vendor, you, you'll have access to these titles if you give us this dollar amount. We have unlimited access to all those titles in that package for the time period, which is typically one year. At the end of that year, we choose the books that we want to own. And um, we're looking at usage statistics and how they connect with curriculum. And once we select those, then we own that portion of, of, of all the books that they let us look at. So we're going to step back just a, a moment, just this one slide about patron-driven acquisitions, also known as demand-driven acquisition. It's similar, but what happens is we don't pay up front. All these records are added um, to, the, to the catalog throughout the year. And uh, a, a, it's based, which records do we get? Well, it's based on a uh, sort of like an approval plan, our approval plan with um, Gobi, our primary book vendor, um, and a couple of other vendors. Um, we have a, a, a plan that says, oh, we wanna get materials on this subject matter, these geographic regions, um, this or that kind of a, of a definition of what we wanna get. So any ebook that matches those parameters, we'll get a record for. Then once it's in the catalog for people to run into, we get invoiced when a book is triggered. And for most of these um, plans, it's on the first use, but JSTOR lets us use them more than that before they'll, they'll do the trigger. Um, UNCGA has PDA plans with Gobi uh, for ProQuest eBook Central and EBSCO eBooks. And then we also have a plan with JSTOR. Why EBA plans? Well, we've got a lot of print books from uh, our approval plan that, that were not being used. And our eBooks are the preferred format in many cases. We buy titles that are used, not just what we hope gets used. And we've got um, access to these really good uh, what good publishers that we think are valuable for uh, uh, as academic publishers, then we get more usage and a lower cost per use than the traditional uh, purchasing model. Here are some of the uh, publishers that we work with. And I'm having, I'm sorry, but I'm having a little trouble with my, um, control panel and I cannot get it to come back up. So if there's any problem, you're gonna, someone's gonna have to run to my office and tell me. Okay, it popped it back up. Thank you, Sam, did you do that? Oh, <laughs> I don't know, it's a mystery. Um, so here are some of the publishers, Oxford and Cambridge University Press, Wiley, JSTOR um, has a lot of publishers on it. Project Muse has a lot of, a lot of publishers on it. Taylor and Francis, and then ACS, American Chemical Society, we just 
are at, we're at the end of one year with them and or the second year with them and we are not continuing that the the cost per um title is just too much it doesn't really it, it, we haven't gotten that good of use so um that one we're dropping all right taylor and francis has a uh there's a ulac deal that's uh university library uh academic council that's the deans or directors of all the university library system uh in north carolina uh libraries so collectively we have access to 39,000 ebooks that's a lot of ebooks so we we're we we say we're going to commit to paying x amount of dollars at the end of the year and we get access to 30,000 not 39,000 books uh, primarily the imprints are CRC Press and Rutledge. Uh, the books were published 2016 to 2021. These guys do not let us have access to the current publication year. They're the only ones who do that. Um, it's unlimited DRM free access. And we're gonna talk about DRM free here in just a second. Um, just so you have a sense of the kinds of books that uh, show up, these are the top three titles um, and the number of uses they have in the most recent selection period. Okay, unlimited users, that's the best thing. Of course, we want we don't want people to get stuck with a one user option and then say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I can't get to this book. So these are unlimited. If it's DRM free, there's no digital rights management. Uh, there are no restrictions in that way. So um, you don't, uh, you can download a chapter and it won't expire. You can do unlimited printing, unlimited copy and paste, and then there are other advantages. So let's look at a couple of deals. Wiley. <clears throat> It was a ULAC deal until this year, it became a Carolina consortium deal. We have access to 23,000 eBooks. We are buying books for all the 16 participating UNC schools. And those titles are selected by the efficiencies working group. So they selected 1100 titles for the term that's, uh, that's just, uh, that ended, well, just as an example, they, they, these were added last year. And everybody has all those books. Uh, we're in the fourth year of this program. It's unlimited DRM free access. And we're averaging about 500,000 uses per year at a cost per use of 25 cents. So that is really great. Oxford University Press has a Carolina consortium deal for North Carolina schools and um, South Carolina, which is also part of Carolina consortium. They're creating their own deal. That includes UNC press titles. We have access to 17,000 books. Um, in 2021, we purchased 1,000 monographs and 77 UNC Press titles that were published. That's kind of, this, the UNC Press titles aren't exactly part of the EBA plan, but that's part of our agreement that we got this EBA plan, plus we're buying the UNC Press titles. And uh, there's, a, um, from the uh, EBA backlist, uh, we purchased 107. This is invoiced through Gobi. So there, sometimes we're paying the publisher, sometimes we're working through our primary book vendor. It really varies and that's why it gets confusing. JSTOR is our own deal, UNCG. It's got two components. It's got the DDA for the front list titles, the most currently published titles, and then access to 70,000 eBooks in the EBA plan, which is older, older books, like by several years, just uh, not that far back, but um, it's like just a few years difference between what's the current stuff and the, and the backlist. So it's still really valuable information. Uh, and they charge us based on our journal usage because we have JSTOR e-journal uh, e packages with them. So um, that's, that's kind of a different uh, method for choosing how we are going to pay. And they're in, integrated with the e-journals on JSTOR's platform. So it's really easy to find, uh, find the materials as far as patrons consider also unlimited DRM free and it's a bunch of different academic publishers. So here to give you a sense of um, how much we're spending way back in fiscal year 2014, our print approval plan, which is how we originally got a lot of this kind of approval type stuff, um, which is different from what um, title by title purchases where you know faculty say, hey, I want this this book. We do that too. This is a just this. This is just the approval kind of side, um, where they send things automatically. We got seventy seven hundred books that year, totaling two hundred ninety nine thousand dollars, and that is without knowing if anyone would ever touch the books that we got. So um, this year, well, I should say last year, 
uh, fiscal 2021, we bought 360 books through the Gobi print approval plan. So we've really reduced, you know, we had 7,700 back in 2014. Now we're down to 360 in the print approvals. The, the books that we purchased through the EBA plans uh, were 2,000, 2000 books. And our Gobi DDA, we got 570 books that we purchased just by people accessing and triggering a purchase. And the JSTOR DDA, 300 books. So we spent 287,000. And we had access, even though we didn't buy everything, we had access to thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of books. Okay. It's not just ebooks that offer an EBA plan. Uh, some journal publishers and streaming platforms offer plans like that, and then you can select purchase content after the subscription year ends. In particular, um, one that I really am excited about is the ProQuest Access and Build offer. That's primary source content, digital collections, newspapers. And so part of that, we pay them a certain amount. Part of that goes to be able to access all of those databases. And then from that dollar amount, at the end of the year, we could just choose um, $93,000 worth of product so that we have that content that we own going forward in the case that we ever have to exit the plant. So um, these are uh, at the bottom uh, a few of the products that we were able to buy and we were, were making decisions based on how much use there is and, and the curriculum. And so our library liaisons are really crucial in us helping to figure out what we want to purchase. And now we're going to access and Anne will share her, her information. Oh, excuse me, it's, it's Marcy. Sorry about that, Marcy. It's okay, I'm, I'm used to being left out. So. <laughs> um, so Christine has told us about all of this great stuff, but really matters is how do I get what I want? How do I find all this stuff? So um, it's important to see how the process works, but you know, I need this ebook for a class, research, or whatever. Just get me the ebook. That's all I care about. Next slide. So here it is in all its glory. The admin side of the collection manager or knowledge base. I use those two terms interchangeably. I'm not really sure if I should or not, but I do. Um, so I guess the whole this whole thing is called collection manager and it has other as aspects, but the collection manager knowledge base. Next slide. So here's just some of the our institution settings. Our OCLC symbol is NGU, in case you're ever asked that in a trivia question. Um, in a contest, you'll know that our symbol is NGU. Um, in our holdings, under the holdings accordion, uh, we have it set to automatically add our holdings when I add something to the knowledge base. Um, proxy information tab is exactly what you think it is. It's where our information is to be able to allow access from off campus. And also there we enable Google Scholar and its settings are there. With the discovery accordion, um, you can actually we can actually determine the display order for providers. So if you look up a journal article, um, we can decide if we want ProQuest results to show first, Taylor and Francis results to show first, EBSCO. We can set that order. So that's a pretty neat feature. And then we don't rely on mark records as much as we used to with our old. Um, ILS because we don't really upload mark records, but we do sometimes get mark records if we create something called query collections and to get data out of the system. Next slide. So <clears throat> this is just a screenshot of some of our EBM collections. Um, we have 1,663 total collections. Some of those we have created created as custom collections as you can see the these all end with uncg so these are collections that we've created some are collections that oclc has created and they maintain them but we have access to 3.7 million titles 
And of those 3.7 million titles, 2.6 of them, almost 2.7 are ebook titles. <clears throat> so of all these collections, 20 of our collections are EBM. And as Christine said in the beginning, that gives us access to 213, almost 214,000 extra titles that we might not have been able to have access to just due to the fact that we couldn't have afforded to purchase collections. So that's how great the, these MBA, 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 MBA collections, um, EBM collections, PDA, DBA, that's how great these collections are because it does give us access without that upfront up purchasing and you know spending that money that none of us have anymore. So, and I also want to point out that I do have some collections that have purchased, and so I do try to differentiate, just as Christine mentioned with the American Chemical Society, I try to differentiate between what we purchased out of that collection. So when we do end, um, we you already have those collections pulled out, and, and they'll be there for, for perpetual use. Next slide. So this is a KBART. So KBART um, stands for Knowledge, Base, and Related Tools. So that was created by the National Information Standards Organization in 2010 to improve the supply of data to link resolvers and knowledge bases in order to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of open URL linking. So KBART files are the industry standard file format for knowledge bases and it provides title lists in this format to ensure that the content you are entitled to is accessible to our end users. So basically it's just a fancy spreadsheet with uh, standard column headings and we'll look at it a little more closely. As you can see, hopefully, I know it's a little bit small, there's a, a title column, uh, print identifier, online identifier are usually ISBNs or, or ISSNs, journal, uh, coverage dates for journals, um, publication dates for, for ebooks, URLs. Um, we can go to the next slide. And then here's the rest of the K bar. As you can tell, there are many columns, um, whether it's an ebook, whether it was a full text journal, whether it's abstracts, publisher name. Uh, any notes we can want to include. Um, obviously, OCLC number is a, a big thing for us as a WMS user. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of an overlook of the KBART that I use to upload into the KB to create these collections. Next slide. So here we've gone into a collection. Uh, the Cambridge EBM collection. So as you can see, the data in the KBART is now uploaded and it can now be discoverable in our catalog or in discovery. There's our title, our coverage depth, whether it was an ebook or our full text journal, the IS, um, ISBN, the, obviously the website link and <clears throat> the OCLC number. Next slide. A little more in-depth look at a title is um, as displayed here, um, the title, the coverage depth again, the URL, um, and of course sometimes we have to go in and keep those up to date. They change, and but the most important thing for us, as I say, being a WMS library is the OCLC number. If a title does not have an OCLC number associated with it, then you won't find it in the catalog you won't find it in discovery. So there are titles in our KB that for whatever reason, when I uploaded them, it did not find an OCLC number to match it. So therefore it's, it's there in the KB, but it's not discoverable in the catalog. Um, and as you'll see, I have the two arrows, the grouped OCLC numbers allows all instances of that title to display. So it'll find the OCLC number for the print, pull it together so it'll pop up as a result. Uh, if it were to be large print, you know, it, it, it groups them all together, ebook versions, etc. So that's about it for me. We'll see, we'll hear what Ann has to tell us.
Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about how the EBA plans impact the order requests that I get for title by title selections. So um, in the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I manage these orders against our plans. So I receive a lot of ebook requests because we've been moving more and more to ebooks being requested rather than print. A lot of times it's because faculty are using them in uh, classes and to provide wider access. So um, I look for these publisher titles, the EBA titles, to see if that if we have that option for these ebooks that are requested. So when I receive an ebook request or a book request, the publisher ebook options are what I look for. And the price of these ebooks are usually lower than on the platforms like ProQuest or, or EBSCO. The first thing I always do is I check the library catalog for holdings for the title. Um, it's routine for all requests because this allows me to see if this title is available on one of our platforms, or it's also important to make sure it's not available on something like an NC Live platform or previously purchased from ProQuest or EBSCO. It's also good to check to make sure the title is not a journal issue that is now being marketed as an ebook. We may have the online journal and can provide that available access at no additional cost. There are also open access ebook collections in our catalog. So you have to check all of these different uh, possibilities. If the title isn't in our catalog, then I check on our book vendor website, Gobi to see what ebook options are available. Is this available on a publisher platform? If I see that it is on a publisher platform and it's not displaying in our catalog, then I wanna get more information. So that's when I do some troubleshooting in the next slide. I go directly to the publisher ebook platform and see if the title is unlocked and available to access. Is this included in one of our plans? If it is unlocked, but not displaying in the catalog, then I'll contact Marcy and ask her to add the holdings so the ebook will be available. We don't need to purchase it. If we have the title on an EBA plan, the publisher will not allow duplication, which means that I can't go into Gobi and purchase this ebook for perpetual um, access if it's in the EBA plan. I can purchase on one of the other platforms like ProQuest or EBSCO, but that would be a duplication and already um, um, and more cost. So sometimes the problem with the EBA title may involve questions about, well, what specific titles are available in our collection? And when we have these questions, then we, I or EL or HELP will contact the vendor, the publisher, customer service to help with any issues about what is included in the in the um, program, because not everything is in these EBA programs that the publisher puts out. For example, Cambridge com um, Companions are not part of our Cambridge EBA. Um, recently, a faculty member found an inactive link to one of these companions in our uh, catalog. So then we have to go back to the publisher and clarify the situation to find out is this supposed to be included because we wanna make sure we have all the titles available to us and the appropriate links. This, this companion, we had to go and order through Gobi because it was not in our EBA program. Sometimes titles can be classified as textbooks, can kind of be reclassified and may get taken out of EBA uh, plans and move to a different type of collection. So that could cause some questions that we may need to consult with the publisher. But basically with troubleshooting, as Marcy will tell you, if we can't fix it, if we don't know it's broken, so report any um, questions or errors to ER help, and then we can get started on this. So in the next slide, how do we um, make these selections? Um, we receive um, updates throughout the year of usage, but we receive an annual point report at the end of the year. And so these reports are what we use in making the title selections to purchase for perpetual access by our library. So usage is the most important 
um, thing that we use in making these determinations. A title may look interesting to buy from reviews, but may not be used by our patrons during that year. So usage stats are very important. Another important criteria that we use are, um, is this book on our e-textbook list? Usually if, it, if an e-textbook title from our list has the high usage and would be selected for purchase. Um, selection by a class um, as an, a textbook, whether highly used or not, shows that the title may be important to purchase. So if there's a high use, not a high usage for the e-textbook, it could be that the class has not been notified about the access by their instructors or has not found the um, title on our e-textbook libguide which if you don't use it, it's a very good resource and very valuable to students and faculty. Also, the title could have been accessed and downloaded during a one-time use by the student or instructor. So the use of stats would not reflect the high use of the title. The class may have lower enrollment. There may be many possibilities, but if it's an e-textbook, we wanna include it in our purchases and their selections. We might look at, has this ever been title been requested by a patron, even in print format? Um, it may be considered important by a patron and may be more widely used later. We like to avoid duplication with access on other ebook platforms if possible. So often I will check titles to see if there's access available on other ebook platforms. Um, do we own it perpetually there? Um, there may be duplications, and there are duplications between um, ebooks on platforms. A lot of times you see this with JSTOR and Project Muse. They'll have some of the same titles. So we want to make sure that we can use our funds to provide access to as many titles as possible. So with JSTOR and Project Muse selections, I'll look a bit closer to try to avoid the duplication and to allow selection of a wider variety of titles. A lot of the duplication checking would, will depend on the number of titles on the list and the time restraints for the process. Another thing that we look at are the subject areas based on previous trends or known areas of study. There's a set dollar amount for the title selections with each EBA program that can be used to purchase the perpetual um, ownership titles. So when we get down to a single use of a uh, title in our usage stats, there are usually more titles than we have money to purchase. So to complete the, the purchases with the money that we have available, we look at the selections um, based on a, trying to provide access to a wide variety of um, disciplines. We try to select titles over a variety of subject areas so that everyone can get some new content. And the work of ordering title by title selections from our departments across the campus, I sometimes start seeing trends in subject areas. One that comes to mind right away is there's been a recent interest from many departments across campus in Native American history and life. So I would try to use these known trends in considering title options. It's also important to check the publication dates because we wanna purchase the most recent materials. These EBA plans save a lot of money for the departmental funds. Having the ebook accessibility allows departments to use their funds for other resources. For example, one department on campus would have spent their entire budget in September without these EBA plans because many of the titles that they selected and sent to me were available on these platforms through this program. One department always submits way too many requests and could possibly ever be purchased with their funds, but the EBA and the DDA provide many of the titles that they desire. So in the next slide, this is the most important criteria for selecting an ebook for perpetual ownership. Um, in the EBA plans, and that is usage. That is the main thing that we use in these selections. So what we wanna do um, uh, to, to, to emphasize why we think these EBA plans are valuable 
uh, it's because we are getting access to thousands of eBooks that are from highly regarded pu academic publishers. And what we end up owning is material that has been used. And a lot of times that means more use will come. Uh, so we, we find that, that EBA plans really have made a big difference for us. So, so thank you and we'll take any questions. Okay, I wanna to get to the ones that were in the chat. I just didn't wanna like stop y'all's flow. Great job. Um, so Alyssa asked, I think it was like right towards the end of Marcy's, um, if the title URL is updated in the OCLC record, does it automatically update in the KB or do you have to do that manually? Well, <clears throat> it would depend again, if it's a collection that, that we have created and we maintain, or if it's a collection that OCLC has created. And basically um, OCLC creates collections from um, information and data that they get from the publisher. So obviously if Taylor and Francis decides to change the whole syntax of their URL, then they would send that information to OCLC and OCLC would update those collections. And then there, there have been times that we have found a broken link for whatever reason, and we've corrected that ourselves. Um, years ago, we were not able to do that. We would have to actually contact customer service and they would have to, but they've made um, great strides in collection manager. And now we are able to create um, correct a lot of problems that we find. And then there again, if it's a collection we have created, then obviously we have to update them. Great. And so the next question was around the time Anne started. Um, so Vanessa asked, how often do we find we already have access um, when you were talking about like purchasing the eBooks? Right. Um, well, quite often when people request titles, they haven't checked our catalog um, for whatever reason. I mean, people are busy and faculty may run across titles or get emails about these wonderful books that are available. And so they just, oh, we wanna have that one. So I would say it happens quite often that I'll send to them, oh, we have this and this is how we have it, um, which is a good thing, you know. <laughs> That's why I always check the catalog before I order anything, just yeah. to make sure. As Anne knows, it happens to me all the time when <laughs> I ask for ebooks for my areas. Well, that's so, why I started with, I always check the catalog. It doesn't matter whether anybody has or not. I'm going to check. Yeah. Okay. So Lois asks, how does budgeting work if you're not sure how many books will get clicked on triggering a purchase? If that is it that every click instantly triggers payment or is there a bill with all the item um, clicked on that you get at once? I think I might have misunderstood this, LOL. <laughs> okay, um, with the EBA stuff, we pay in advance and we're gonna get a certain number based on that dollar amount. With the DDA or PDA, patron driven acquisitions, and I'm sorry that this is so confusing, um, we just estimate based on past experience. Now, I remember years ago when I went to the Charleston conference and this kind of the DDA plans were just starting out. It was like, oh my gosh, somebody from some special science library said all of our money was spent in the first month and a half. We've, we've never had that problem. I mean, I, I, think, I think companies help work this out a little bit and we have access to a lot of different things. So we haven't run into a problem with over, uh, you know, if, if we've overspent some, it's been balanced by underspending some other way. So we haven't had an issue where um, we've had, we've only had to stop a plan one time, right? And was that with Rittenhouse with the R2 platform? Yes. Yeah. And Leah's, uh, that's nursing stuff. And so Leah and uh, Ann and I have worked with um, the rep from, from Rittenhouse and, uh, and we have had to stop that uh, plan during the year, but otherwise we have not had to do that. And you know, like years ago, it was, hey, you know, one way you can get around this without buying the book is do a short-term, short-term loan, which is sort of like an ILL, where okay, the first guy who borrows it or uses it, it's you. You have to spend ten dollar and sixty-five cents, 
And the next time, you know, and we were doing short-term loans, but we only did that the first year. After that, we said, hey, if it's gotten used once, we want to own it, so we just buy it. Any, anything else, Ann, on that? No, I think that's pretty clear. Okay. So Leah asked, any advice for working with an instructor who is hoping to use a specific title as a course textbook? I usually suggest a purchase in case the ebook goes away before or early in that semester. Yeah, that's um, about a year or so ago, the um, EBA plans, those publishers would stopped allowing me to actually purchase the book on Gobi. Um, that's why I mentioned that in my presentation. They won't allow the duplication. Um, generally, most of the EBA plans, I don't think they remove too many titles during the year, um, but we can always purchase, but it would be a duplication, the ProQuest or EBSCO um, ebook. Um, but a lot of times those are not unlimited. They might be a three user. So um, it always can be, a quandary. <laughs> so Rachel asked, is there an easy way to tell in the catalog um, if we own it already? And I would add for me also in Gobi, um, if it's on order, um, you may have said that. I'm concerned that I've not been recommending purchases because the catalog makes it look like we own it. Yeah, um, true. As I stated when we were I was showing the collections earlier, um, I do try to note when we purchase, but that's only if we've if been in a, a DDA, a EBM uh, type of program. Um, I, I don't normally just differentiate and say, you know, this is an own collection. These are, so um, I would say that if it doesn't state it's DDA, EBM, then, you know, Eight times out of 10, we own it. But if you're, you know, really want to know for sure about a collection, shoot me an email and I'll let you know for sure. I, I don't know if that's the best answer to the question, but that's the best answer I can give you. And in Gobi, usually it will have a note that the ebook has shipped. Um, I think Oxford is the only one because I think we're invoiced through Oxford. It'll say e collection invoiced and it may not be quite available yet but it shows that it is supposed to be available to us through that platform but usually it'll say shipped in gobi okay does anyone have any other questions in the chat or you can unmute and ask questions so i'm not sure how much difference it makes whether we own the EBS stuff or not, because we're pretty committed to staying in those plans. As long as we stay in them, we have access to everything. Now, you know, Christine did say we were dropping ACS. Um, it's because it wasn't used, right? So we might drop some selectively, but it's not like a bunch of stuff's going to disappear that people are using. I mean, the reason we would drop it is if it isn't used. As long as these pr programs are heavily used, which they mainly are, we'll stay in them year after year after year. So faculty should have a reasonable amount of competence in assigning these things. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, you can always ask and follow up on specific things. Like we know, for example, that the Wiley deal ends on June 30th, all right? So there's no way that it would, the Wiley stuff would all disappear in December, right? The only way it would disappear is on June 30th. And we've already paid for the next year. So we know we've got it until June 30th of 2023. So I mean, if you're really concerned about a specific thing being assigned and being here for a specific semester, you can ask us for details. Um, we, we generally know at least a year in advance if there's any likelihood that something would be canceled. So we should be able to give faculty pretty good advice about whether or not to assign something. And wasn't it Cambridge that totally took out all their textbooks and you can buy Cambridge textbooks, that would be total, a totally different collection and would not, none of those would be involved with, with the EBA plan. Yeah, it was Wiley that took out their textbooks, but then they gave us a chance to buy a bunch of them. So we did, um, and we're still messing with trying to get the mark records figured out on that. 
But yeah, I mean, there's always some factors beyond our control that publishers could change their title lists, but that's, you know, that's not really a cancellation issue. That's a different thing. And mostly the, the ones that change the most are the ProQuest DD, um, DDA. That's, or um, those are the ones that would change. And they usually allow us a chance to purchase. And those can be purchased perpetually anyway, if somebody wanted that as a textbook. But that's really the one that changes the most. I agree with Tim, the EBAs really do not change during the year. Right, and there's, there's a difference between textbooks and assigned readings, right? So yes. there are books that are published intended to be textbooks. And the, the, these plans are very light on those. They don't have a lot of that. But they do have a lot of scholarly monographs that are assigned readings in some specialized classes, particularly in grad programs. And our, our collective cost avoidance across the system for students is estimated to be about $6 million a year. So we're buying or making available $6 million worth of assigned readings to the students across the 17 campuses per year uh, through our three ULAC deals that we're paying $750,000 for, which is pretty nice return on investment um, you know, for making education affordable to students and have, making sure everybody's got their textbook on day one of class and everything. And that doesn't even count the value we get from adding these things to our collection and making them available to our researchers and faculty as well. Yeah, it looks like the rest of the stuff in chat are mostly comments, you know, Leah and Rachel, well, Rachel was pointing out that, um, you know, there's always the fear of a textbook getting dropped in the middle of the semester, which y'all talked about. Um, and then Leah says the textbook question is pretty common for me, at least I'm thinking a class might use it as an out there ebook that other schools don't use. So that specific title might not get used, but it sounds like access overall is pretty secure. Uh, Joe mentioned uh, at me that uh, they've started noticing that the Gobi says ship to library um, mm -hmm. or one that says like alt ed preparing to ship in the upper right by the alternate editions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always trying to look for that stuff. Um, and then, yeah, maybe an FAQ, Vanessa says, and Lois says that's an awesome stat. So are there any other questions, comments, concerns? This has been really useful for me, I can say. It's a liaison, I'm always trying to learn about this stuff. And I just wanna remind you that we do have a fund. We, we allocate money every year for e-textbooks. And there's that list that Marcy, I mean, I mean, Michelle and Anne review, and then Marcy's involved with making sure they're available, but we will order textbooks based on what the campus uh, bookstore shares with us about assigned books. So, so some of these things that are textbooks, we are purchasing both, uh, well, three different times of the year for the fall semester, spring semester, and summer. And by now we've purchased so many that every year um, some things are already owned and that's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting a lot of uh, praise in the chat for that and your presentation. I want to say too, I really like I put the link for the course adopted text guide that um, I think Michelle maintains right yes. um, and highly recommend she's done some really cool data viz stuff on there. Um, I would uh, highly recommend checking it out. I think I don't know if she's here. I think she's using Google data. It looks great. It's really useful. I was looking at it the other day when I was thinking about firm order purchases for my areas. So check it out, Michelle, I'm giving you praise. Yeah, she's done a very good job with that. It's very easy to access what, you, what you're looking for. Yes, mm -hmm. it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you're getting a lot of praise in the chat, of course. I'm gonna give you like the applause, you got applause afterwards. So I'm gonna um, slowly say, I think I don't see any other questions. I don't see any hands raised. It's all just applause at this point. Um, so well, thank we, you all. We do accept Apple Pay and Venmo yes. too, if you if y'all want to send us so yes marcy's looking for that payout from uh youtube apple pay all the apps <laughs> yes um okay great well y'all have 15 minutes back of your life in case you have a 12 p.m meeting uh thanks again to christine ann and marcy remember the recording is on the ulblc guide that i dropped in the chat um let me let jenny and i know if you have any questions or any ideas for future topics. We're always taking uh, stuff. So thanks again, y'all, and have a good day. Thanks, thank you, Thank Sam. you. Sam, we appreciate it. Bye.